brothers and sisters. Shall I sing to you one of Zion's songs, songs of joy, songs of celebration? It's such an odd part of Lent, the fourth Sunday. You wear robes because something is happening. You know you're drawing near. We wear it one other time in Advent. Why? Because the celebration closes in, and we know the victory is already won. Joy just overflows. It just kind of happens. It sort of bubbles up unexpectedly, and suddenly you're more alive than you were a second ago. It's very strange. It's like a surprise party. Occasionally those are enjoyable. And you're like, behold, all of these people whom I love have all gathered. What a shock, what a joy, what new life I've discovered. It just, something happens and you're ignited when you see your beloved, when you see your wife walk into the room, or when the soldiers come back from deployment and their families see them, and their wives and their children run up to them. Where did that come from? They were perfectly normal a second ago, and now they're ecstatic. This gospel here in John. John is finishing up describing Jesus' meeting with the Pharisee Nicodemus. Nicodemus has come to him at night because he's afraid to be seen with Jesus. They're in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that holy city, that favored place of the Jews. The Jews always greet each other at the New Year next year in Jerusalem, a place of joy. John is wrapping up this discussion. These are the last words that Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, at least on this occasion. We might have met him at some other time. Although if it was the only time he met with Nicodemus, it sure left an impression on him, enough to risk his neck after Jesus had been crucified. But then after he finishes here, Jesus is speaking. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, that keeps showing up in my homilies, and now here it is in the gospel. I must should probably say something about that. So must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then, that's the end of Jesus' speech, and John just starts writing. This just pours out of him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John is just writing now. He's not monologuing. He's not narrating anymore. He just goes. He says, this is the reason he's here. If you don't grasp anything else, you know, pick this up. People hold up the sign, John 3.16 at the football games. Why? Because it's like there's life here. It bubbles out of John. And for 2,000 years, we still read it. And it should excite us. The world can be an awful, nasty, hideous place. It can chew on you. And you have to fight it. And yet there's good. And that good, that's what God's here for. And we get to have that choice, whether or not we come along with him, whether or not we come with him into paradise and get to Enjoy a bit of that here. If you become that window of light that opens up so that others may see the good works of Jesus Christ and they look at you and they say, why is this person so crazy? Why are they so happy? Don't they know who got elected? Don't they know there's a pandemic? Don't they know it rained yesterday or it'll be cold tomorrow or something else? Why are they happy? Where comes this joy? It's a choice. It's a choice. 
That first reading is from Second Book of Chronicles. What is it? It's around chapter 36. Just as Jesus is wrapping up his discussion with the Nicodemus, the chronicler who wrote that, it's a history book. He's wrapping up his history of Israel, and he's rolling it all into one. And he says, here's our history. Here's the history of Judah. God gave us good things. They were good. But you know what? We didn't thank him. We preferred evil. Oh, how similar it is to John's just rush of emotion in his gospel. And we went into exile because when you cut yourself off from the light, it gets dark and you stumble and you fall. And the Jews fall hard because they were at the height. Who else has laws like the Jewish people in the ancient world? No one, because God gave them their laws. They're surrounded on all sides by enemies. They prosper until they don't follow their laws anymore. And then they grow weak and they grow decadent. And first the Assyrians swallow up ten tribes, and then the Babylonians come and take the remainder, the other two, off into exile. And in Babylon we hung up our harps, and there we sat and wept, for without God there is no joy. In the dark where you hide your works, there is only pain and the suffering that is the disease of sin and the laughter of a bloodthirsty tyrant. Oh, how could we sing the songs of Zion which are joy? But God so loves the world, he sends a Messiah. He mentions Cyrus. Cyrus is the first figure in Scripture who is referred to as Meshiach, anointed, a savior figure. He's not even Jewish. But he conquers the Babylonians, and he looks around. And he says, what are the, who are these people Just besides the Babylonians here? And they're like, well, they're Jews. What are they doing here? Send them home. In fact, even better, they must have a God. Maybe they can pray to him for me. And he gives them the option. See, it's a choice, brothers and sisters, whether or not you want to rejoice and be joyful. It's a choice. Why wouldn't you choose to be joyful? Because there's something of work in it. It means you're not God. The source of life comes from outside of you, just as Cyrus comes from outside and rescues the people. Jesus Christ comes from the distance of, that's between heaven and earth, which is vaster than the cos cosmos. And he shows up and he says, look at me, watch me, be like me. And there will be new life, there will be joy. And we back up and we say, well, hang on a sec. Look at all this other stuff I was building. That's pretty good, isn't it? Well, I can't see it clearly. Well, you don't want to look at it too close. We'll just keep that off in the dark. I knew a man and went on pilgrimage. I went on pilgrimage to Zion, holy Jerusalem, back in December of 2019, January 2020. And our guide was a Jew named Abraham. And he spoke this wonderful English. And he grew up in India. What was he doing in India? He told me, well, he says, my family wasn't always in India. Oh, where were they from? He says, Iraq. Oh, really? Why were your parents in Iraq? He said, well, says they'd always been in Iraq since the exile. And you say, what? He says, oh, yes. He says, my family line traces back to the Babylonian exile. And when Cyrus said we could come home, not everybody left. And his family had been in the Iraqi lands, formerly Babylon, since 570 B.C., up until 1930-something, when they immigrated to India for work. And then the State of Israel was established in 1947, 1948, and they all immigrated back 
to that joy-filled land. And now he lives in Jerusalem in his late 70s, early 80s. The heart is restless until it rests in thee, until it goes to the home of the Father, until it goes up Jerusalem and rejects sin and that which disgusts us that we don't want to look at, that we confess in secrecy. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the quiet of the night. You go into the quiet of the confessional and you pour it out. And that is where you gaze upon the brass serpent, so to speak. You listen for the words of Jesus Christ. And they are not the words of condemnation. They are words of great hope. I absolve you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because I love you, because I came to get you. Will you come up and come with me? Well, I'll have to leave the comforts of Babylon. Oh, yes, you will. But it beats staying there and burning with her. The light of God does two things. It reveals and it inflames. It reveals to you your works, be they good or evil. And it inflames. It inflames with love or they set you on fire with a flame that does not go out. And the worm that doesn't die resides in those. The Word of God is alive. That's why we listen to it. That's why we read it. That's why we're all enraptured by these podcasts. Father Schmitz has done us a great service. His read the Bible in a year is bringing you new life. For the Word of God is alive, and it enters into your soul, and you can feel it move. It teaches you how to dance, how to sing, and not for your own sake, but for the sake of God who teaches you the songs of Zion. Lent doesn't last forever. Golgotha is only three hours. The resurrection is for eternity. Whoever lives in the truth comes to the light. Look at you all. You all gather in. Oh, how the numbers keep increasing. I take great joy in that. Whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. This is the greatest work. You do nothing greater in your life, brothers and sisters. You do nothing greater in your life than to come to Mass, than to witness the sacrifice of the Mass, to look upon the bronze serpent who will heal you and who takes all your works and burns away the bad and lifts up the good and forms it into that white garment with which he clothes his bride, the church, and in which we enter into the eternal joy-filled wedding feast, which is the eternal Easter. If that doesn't make you happy, nothing will. God bless you this evening.